Okay, I think we're recording. Let me just share my screen. Um, so, hi everyone, thank you for joining our webinar. I'm Manuela CV. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Alpha. Alpha is a B2B marketplace and we connect companies to the visual arts, but we believe that the arts are a fundamental tool for transformation. Uh, and in 2017, we launched our first initiative around using the arts for exactly that purpose. It was called the Artivism Challenge. It included a challenge where we invited artists from all around the world to submit works in different topics in ocean conservation that were set by an NGO called Oceanic Global, which is a great partner. We then did a beach cleanup in Miami B in, in Miami Bay uh, and uh, used the byproducts of the cleanup for a site-specific installation where we also unveiled the winning works. Sorry, my and this is the side of, of, of that said installation, which was also in a building under construction. So everything was re, re, reused uh, for the installation. And during this period, we met some incredible artists, some of which are gonna be talking today, uh, Basia and, uh, and Jeremy McCain. Uh, I'll let them introduce themselves in a minute. I just wanna show you a few of the artworks that we received during this amazing process. just showing the breadth and the impact of the arts. And, and I'll hand it over to you, Jeremy, so you can introduce yourself, maybe talk a little bit about Lucid, which was the piece that we ended up including, and then we can go on to this super exciting announcement that you have for today. Yeah, thanks, Manuel. Thanks for having me on. It's um, I, I'm loving what you guys are doing. I think it's really great the way that you have found really amazing ways to support artists. And so, but I, I also, I also, you know, realize that you know, being an artist uh, sometimes is, is a very hard thing. And so, my 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 background is uh, I've got a background in tech, um, but I travel all over the place, and I've tried to do whatever I can to focus on the ocean and why we need to protect her. So um, Lucid, as you mentioned, was a mind-controlled art installation that was traveling um, after it was with you. Uh, I, I got an offer from the G7 Presidential Summit uh, through the German ministry, and it was traveling uh, for three years to a number of different cities around the world. Um, and it, basically, it's a neurofeedback device that allows people to meditate, clear their mind, in order to see an alternative change of really what the ocean should be. If they do nothing, it just, all you see is floating plastic and various things that, horrible things that I've photographed around the world. But that's what that was. And, um, and yeah, I'm glad to be here. Thanks for having me. Perfect. Do you want us to, to jump in and show, show the video? Yeah, we can, we can do that. So um, yeah, what you're with the clip that you're about to see is this new art installation called Glitch. And I'll talk a little bit more about how we gather the data, but essentially we are pulling, um, pollution values, converting them to hex, and we're injecting them into one of my fine art pieces. And you get to watch, it's basically, when it's, when it's live, you'll actually get to see it slowly um, deteriorate and um, ruin the actual art piece. And it's directly related to the waterways that we're deploying drones mm -hmm. in the ocean. So, I don't know if there, if there, there may not be audio on this. So just basically I'll, I'll explain real quick. You'll see there's a stream that's happening below at the bottom. These are the hex values that are coming across. And these are actually non habitable things that, um, you know, like the, it's that it's hurting the environment. So we, we, we mark it, we then take it, it's then shipped over into the server that just happens to be in my house. Cause we're all under quarantine. And then, um, it now injects, um, hex values inside my fine art piece. And, um, these these values typically tell your your the JPEG reader um, what color the pixels should be to actually make the image that you have. But now that I'm digitizing pollution and I'm injecting in that place, it's altering the actual natural state of the image. And over time, if it's all left to hell, um, the entire image will be completely corrupt and um, it'll be gone. So, um, yeah. That's that's what glitch is, and so we're announcing it today because today is the 50th anniversary of Earth Day, and I'm super stoked about that. And I think it's a really great time to talk about this. So yeah, 
fantastic, fantastic. Uh, Basha, I don't know if you want to talk a little bit about yourself as well, and then we can pull up a little bit of a few visuals. Sure. Um, hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. Um, my name is Basha Kostrenska, and I'm a multidisciplinary artist. And for many years, I've been interested in waste issues and how those are related to environmental issues and what our relationship to waste says about our relationship to nature and vice versa. Um, and uh, some of the work that I have in the presentation, I think Manuel, you'll have to bring it up, but um, I'll bring it I guess I, I will get into this more um, with the Q&A, but um, just based on like the topic for today's conversation, I wanted to kind of speak a little bit very quickly um, to the sort of the, the things that I try to um, include in my work um, so that my work can serve as a vehicle for positive change and, um, and support and discussions around environmental issues. Um, my work is, as I mentioned, very multidisciplinary. So it ranges from sculptures to large scale installations. And on the screen now is one of my um, large scale wall sculptures that's made out of salvaged oyster farming bags that I pressure washed and cut with a Tetris pattern and then re, um, re-stitched together and then wound the whole thing, um, kind of wrapped the whole uh, armature with salvaged marine debris uh, rope that I found on the beach. So if you go to the next slide, Manuela, you'll see a detailed view of um, two areas from the sculpture where you can see some of the marine debris that I've wrapped around the actual structure. And so craft and handwork are very important in my work um, because I think that it's the best way to show like care and um, and sort of like support this idea of like healing or repair. And these are things I'm obviously interested in as an environmentalist. So a lot of my work, you'll notice there's a lot of craft work and hand work in it. Um, if you go to the next slide, um, you know, the, we were talking in an earlier discussion about beauty and sort of the uh, value or the role of beauty in art um, to inspire activism. And I think that it helps to have a definition to beauty, which is often very subjective. And the one that I have heard that I like most is um, uh, put forth by Elaine Scarry, who is um, a essayist and lecturer and professor. And she defines beauty as the opposite of injury um, and how when it's the opposite of injury, it's a little bit more clear exactly what it is. So a lot of my work too has this element of like repair to it. So what you're looking at here is um, these vessels that I've made from fragments of other fra um, like discarded vessels that I found washed up on the beach. And so I've stitched them together much like a doctor would stitch together a wound and um, presenting these on a plaster pedestal made out of plaster, which is associated with like broken bones and mending. So again, there's like this idea of like care and and like um, and mending in the work. Um, and then and, uh, some of my work also is like very um, large scale interactive sculpture. So um, if you go to the next slide, um, this is Rainbow Cave, which is um, presented at Arcadia Earth, which is a pop-up museum about sustainability issues. And this is part data visualization. So this is 40,000 plastic bags, which is the amount that New York was using, New York State was using every minute uh, before the plastic bag ban went into effect um, in March. Um, and so this is a very sort of like immersive experience that hopefully fills people with awe and kind of gets people to maybe think about um, what that number is and what it means uh, for the environment. Um, and so that's another thing. So like beauty is one thing, but then also like this immersion is something else I try to use in my work to kind of really inspire people to like have these conversations or think about these things um, that I'm thinking about. 
Um, and then the, the other thing is participation. So even in like the sourcing of these bags, I worked and partnered with a recycling company on Long Island, Indigo Plastics. And then if you go to the next slide, this is a piece that I did um, where I invited uh, the public to sort microplastics out from the sand. And then I exchanged um, these little jars of salvage baby food jars um, that I called rainbow collections. And I was giving these out in exchange for the labor that people were doing sorting microplastics out of the sand. So kind of just like I'm interested in, in audience participation um, and social practice. So I think that also lends itself well to activism in that like it really empowers people and hopefully gives them a sense of agency. Um, and then I think, is there is there another one after that or was that it, Manuela? Oh, this, I guess I wanted to speak to like when, when going back to like the rainbow cave, um, just that I think it's really awesome that people are like being able to interact and immerse themselves in the work itself, but then also like what social media is doing um, for for the work. So I wanted to have the lights in the rainbow cave constantly vibrating so that every image was different. And so when people take a selfie, it they sort of like feel like it's their special selfie or it's different from every other selfie out there because the lights are changing. So no two images are the same. And so it kind of hopefully makes the experience a little bit more individual. Um, and I think, was that all? Yeah, I think that's all. We can go back to a few more in, yeah. in a minute. I think I'm just going to jump in yeah. to a first question. Uh, and I think we heard a lot more, you know, about craft work from you, Basha, and how, you know, the process is healing. I would love to hear from you, Jeremy, about, you know, how the role technology plays in your work, especially because it's, it's such two different visions to attack the same problem that I think this, it's extremely complementary. Yeah, no, and I think that's a, a, a great way to kind of position it because, you know, I, the thing that really frustrates me as an artist is is not, or I don't know, maybe just as a human being, it's just I want to, I want to know more information. And I, I spent a lot of time with um, various scientists at NOAA, traveling the world and just meeting marine biologists. And I would ask, you know, questions as if, as if I was a toddler. And I guess if you talk to my wife, she probably would tell you I was a toddler in many ways. Um, but I would be like, well, why do whales breach? Or why does this happen? Or why does that happen? And, you know, I did get a lot of answers, but then they were just like, well, we don't know. We don't have the data sets for that. So two and a half years ago, a little over two years ago, uh, I launched a, a, a company called uh, the Ocean Currency Network at the World Economic Forum in Davos, Switzerland. And um, the, the idea was is that, well, why don't we just fill the gaps? And you know, there is there is a reason why we need to have this kind of data. Um, Lord Kelvin said, um, if we were to improve something, we must first measure it. And so um, if you're not measuring something, how do you know that there's going to be an issue? And then this was right around the time too where I started seeing that, you know, gosh, there's there's uh, there's there's tons of bleaching that's happening in the, in the Great Barrier Reef. There's dead zones in the oceans. And it's like a lot of times we look at these situations where there's too much plastic in the ocean and we don't we look at it at the aftermath. We say, gosh, this is horrible. These animals have died or whatever's happened. But we don't actually put a lot of um, uh, it, like focus on pre prevent, preventing something before they become a catastrophe. And so um, data plays a big role in that on the scientific side. But the other challenge is, is that, you know, when scientists are doing these really amazing things, and by the way, some of the stuff in the papers that, that they've produced around, you know, humpback whales, as an example, is pretty amazing stuff. Um, but on average, about six to 10 people will actually read those papers. And a lot of times that those papers are used to get more funding for the, for the, for the science scientific uh, community. Um, I was actually brought in a long time ago with Noah as an artist to come take that same story, what they were doing, and then actually push forward um, with those guys. And so that 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 is a way for me to get the scientific community and the work that they're doing out to the public. And so, um, you know, I think by creating art and using data, putting those two things together, it gives us a way to kind of visualize things. and. Um, you mentioned uh, you mentioned um, Lucid. That was the first uh, installation that um, we, you and I worked on, and that we, that you showed at uh, Art Basel. And you know that was an idea of getting people to think differently. But how do you tell someone to think differently? And so I always think that doing something visually is really important. And so um, 
by kind of marrying those two kind of technical, uh, it, it is it is a bit um, mundane when you're trying to put all these things together, and then you find that you're like, you know, you'll get you'll get stopped by some routine and some programming that's like, why I'm spending all my time on this one little problem when I have like this whole message that I'm trying to work on. Sometimes you feel like, gosh, I think I'm wasting time, but when it all does come together, it people do have another understanding or a, a realization of 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 really what that impact is. And that's, that's the thing that I kind of want. And I know that's the theme for today is like, how do we, how do we use art for impact? And um, a lot of times uh, we sometimes, even with environmental art, we just kind of just rub salt in the wound and say, look how bad this is. Isn't that awful? But I think that we can use art to even extend beyond and say, you know what, it is bad, but here are some potential ways that we can make a difference. And, um, you know, I don't know what all those ways are, but I'm sure trying my best to try to figure that out. Fantastic. Fantastic. And I think that kind of like leads uh, a little bit more to, to exactly that question, which I think I'm going to ask to you, Basha, because Jeremy told us a little bit more. What do you think as art as a means to draw attention to environmental issues? Uh, which issues is your work mainly focused on? How do you explore them in your creative practice? Mm -hmm. um, well, I definitely am drawn to the plastic pollution and waste issues. I think particularly because I was first just drawn to the material itself and what it and as a material says about our current moment. And I think one thing that art can do really well is represent and um, not even represent, but like take note of or um, create a historical document of what our moment is and also allow us to see a little bit more ab about our moment or like understand it a little more or, or see it in a different way. So I feel that, you know, something like trash, you know, people see it all the time every day you know, 10 times a day. And so how do I take it and maybe present it in a different way so people consider it differently? And so that's like the challenge for me always is um, how do you make something discarded precious and, and how do you spark these conversations that I'm interested in? And the conversations, honestly, for me as an artist um, are just that, they're really like open-ended, I'm very much like Jeremy said, like I'm always asking questions, like these partnerships I have with recyclers, um, they're really fascinating because I've been learning so much about all the challenges that um, the recycling and waste industry faces that I had no idea about really. Um, and it's really made me more sensitive to just how challenging the problem is and, you know, how complex the solutions need to be. Um, so yeah, that's, does that answer the question? It does, it does. And I have a follow on question, which actually works for the two of you. So maybe we start with you, Basha, since we're already in the topic. How does your art practice invite its audience to develop awareness, ask questions and imagine solutions? Mm -hmm. um, well, definitely like through the participation of, of um, the audience, I think it does that um, with the Legacy Oasis, which was that beach oasis filled with microplastics. A lot of um, the participants who came through weren't even aware about the microplastic issue. Um, a lot of them were. And um, for a lot of people, it was sort of exciting to see because I, I didn't mention this, but the artwork was presented at the Brickell City Center in the heart of like of this commercial luxury shopping mall. So it was like really also um, an interesting context for the work. Um, and I think through like really participation in the work, um, people are able to sort of feel like they have a role to play in the making or the experiencing of the artwork. So I try to engage people that way, um, if at all possible or through even like the sourcing of uh, my materials. So some of the work that's a little bit more sculptural or craft-based object oriented, um, I still rely heavily on other people for like sourcing my materials. So 
with the oyster farm bags. I've partnered with um, an oyster farmer who has nothing to do with these, who has nothing to do with these old bags except put them in the trash. Um, so I crowdsource often, like a lot of my materials. I also have um, reached out through Instagram actually to a lot of eco warriors, environmentalists, beach cleanup uh, organizations and groups and, and have actually sourced materials through um, crowdsourcing that way also. Fantastic. How about you, Jeremy? Well, I know the answer, but you know. Yeah, I mean, I think, it's, I think it's a great question because I think, you know, that's that's the drive, right? That's the overall mission is just to focus on action. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, with um, with Lucid, um, the thought was, is like, you know, if we could use neurofeedback to get you to think differently about um, our shared environment. I mean, it's actually... Uh, under the United Nations Convention Law of the Seas, um, it was con it, it's actually considered the common heritage of mankind. Um, so it's all of ours, and it's all of ours responsibility. Um, but sometimes we are not even aware. In fact, actually, um, when we were in Brussels, um, we had uh, we we the Lucid was actually right in front of the Parliament building, and um, I got a call from the curator and said, "Hey, you know, all of the members of Parliament have actually come through," um, and somebody made a comment that. You know that uh, they didn't realize that the plastic problem was what it was, and um, they they had a they had a, a I guess a proposed ban on single use plastics uh, to end, and the, it never made the floor. It just kept getting pushed off because there was other things. And um, you know, there's thousands of people that worked on this particular piece of legislation, but this one individual said, you know, I think we should definitely make sure that we at least talk about it. About six months later. Um, it did. And it, I'm not saying that it was because of the art installation that we got this, we got this uh, in legislation, but um, you know, we're all saying the same things and we have a united voice and that helps. But the United, uh, the European Union uh, decided to ban single use plastics with the exception of bottles, but come on, we got to give them a break, right? Um, mm -hmm. By 2021. So that was really exciting. And, and so that, that kind of thing leads to action. Um, in glitches uh, scenario, I really wanted to kind of up the ante a little bit because I wanted to have something that was measurable that, that, that the average person could make impact because I'm always like, I get the question, I'm, I'm, Basha, I'm sure you get the question as well. And it's like, okay, well, what's, what's the one thing that I can do? And that's like nails on the chalkboard to me because it's like, there's no real way to answer that question. Um, you know, somebody said to me the other day, uh, they said, well, one of the ways that you can actually do it is, is, you know, change your 401k because a lot of times your 401ks are invested in fossil fuels and some of these other kinds of things, which is actually a good, good answer. Um, but I wanted to create something that was a little bit more tangible and that's what glitch is. And I, you know, I thought, well, gosh, if we knew really what was in the waterways, uh, you know, where we're deploying these drones and the, and the people that were actually contributing to runoff, they knew what their individual impact was, then maybe they could stop and allow this element of regeneration, which is, I would say out of all of the things that, that I like to focus on, it's regeneration because we use this awful, horrible term called sustainability. I don't know if you realize this or not, but uh, we're in a crisis. We, there's no reason why we should ever re uh, sustain a crisis, um, but we can let the earth regenerate. And I want to be able to use tools uh, like Glitch to be able to let people know that, you know, hey, here's a tool that we can be used that just tells a story. And I think from there, kind of to Bosch's point, People then kind of stair step and they say, well, gosh, I never knew about this, never thought about this. And they can see that they're making a little impact and they start to kind of tree branch off into other things. Um, and I think that's really where the real magic happens. I mean, people will, when, when people become aware, um, that's great. I don't think anybody intentionally says, oh, I'm going to destroy the planet. You know, when people go to Starbucks, they don't ask for a plastic lined paper cup that's not recyclable. They just want coffee. So you know, if we if we make the public more aware, they vote with their wallets, and I think real change can happen. Yeah, I think it's fair to say that uh, an image does tell a thousand stories, right? And that's why we're in the business of of making beautiful things because be because beautiful things have power. And I think that draws me a little bit to my next question: uh, the why do you think it's more compelling to use beauty versus scare tactics? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, well, I guess I'll jump in. Um, <laughs> well, I think that beauty 
you know, scare tactics, when I think of scare tactics, you know, I think of something kind of abject and it's just human nature to want to turn away from anything that reminds us of our own death um, or from suffering because we are in the, you know, we're just programmed to survive. And beauty, again, going back to this definition of the opposite of injury um, specifically, is um, really tells us a lot about why we would turn towards it. And I think why it can be so um, important to, or why it is important to really talk about it or think about it when you're making an artwork about something that is a little bit challenging. Um, I think it really does open up the senses in a way that engenders empathy in a way that um, something that is a little bit like a scare tactic or something that's abject won't do. So um, definitely I've, um, I've been of the mindset that I can absolutely use beauty. It doesn't, it's a little bit ironic um, to use beauty because, you know, like for example, I'm, I'm speaking of about plastic pollution in the ocean and I'm making, you know, a beautiful sculpture so it is a little bit ironic, but I've sort of come to embrace that as part of my campy aesthetic or my eco camp aesthetic. Um, <laughs> and I just kind of like push it a little bit to, and I think if you're self-aware about what you're trying to do, I think it's, it's absolutely legitimate to use it as a tool. Yeah, no, I mean, I think, you know, there's no better time to to use a Jacques Cousteau quote than on the 50th anniversary of Earth Day. But, you know, Jacques Cousteau said, said that people protect what they love and they love what they understand and they understand what they are taught. And I think that, you know, using beauty is a way of actually doing that. I mean, we, we often, um, we see scare tactics and I do think it's important. I do think that we need to know what those risks are. But I do think that, you know, we are going to motivate people when they fall in love with something and um, you're not going to fall in love with a pile of trash in, in the corner. Um, but all of these things at one point had beauty. And I think that's where artists come into play because we are the storytellers and we are the ones that can shift that perspective and hopes to create a greater action. Fantastic. So I have one last question and then we're going to open up for questions. So please feel free to type in, wave your hand, et cetera. We'll, mm -hmm. we'll get to your questions after this one. Uh, and it's for the two of you. So maybe we can start with, uh, with Jeremy, since you were already speaking, how has the current crisis impacted your practice? Yeah. Great question. Um, <laughs> which I think like everybody else is thinking about this as well. And it's like when it first happened. And so, I mean, I have, I had lots of like speaking engagements, I had exhibitions planned. Um, and so I was like, wow, man, 2020 is going to be such a great year. Um, I, I hosted uh, our second annual um, ultramarine ocean action summit uh, that I founded, I co-founded with Susie Mai on Necker Island with Sir Richard Branson. Um, and then right after that event, everything came to a screeching halt. Um, and, you know, I started thinking to myself, like, well, how the heck am I going to create in my house when I'm an ocean guy? And how am I going to exhibit when I can't go anywhere? And so um, it really, for I would say, probably a good two weeks. I mean, just full transparency. I know, like, there's a lot of influencers on social media. They're like, oh, it's a time to reflect and you can be stronger and sharper. And it's like, no, dude, I was super down in the dumps because I'm thinking I have no idea. I didn't expect this. I had everything was pulled out from underneath me and I'm trying to figure out, well, how the heck do I survive? And so um, Glitch was literally born out of this uh, this mindset of like, I still need to get this this work out there. I need to be able to, to find ways to, to use robots if I if I have to, to be able to kind of create a story that still creates impact. And so um I would say, you know, just like with any adversity, it it it, it creates, uh, you know, it creates something of, of a of a challenge. I mean, I mean, some of the most beautiful jewelry are pearls, and pearls are created through adversity. And so I feel like, you know, in some ways, uh, you know, glitch uh, could be the pearl of the COVID crisis for me. Who knows? That <laughs> remains to be seen. But um, look, I, it's not the end of the world. And I think that as long as we are all honest and open with each other and, and we work together as artists and storytellers, I think really amazing collaborations and great things can happen. And I think, I'm, I think we're already seeing that happen. Yeah, awesome. I mean, I definitely um, hear you and feel you and on the crisis um, mode that 
you experienced, Jeremy, I absolutely experienced the same in a similar boat with everything being canceled. Um, obviously my work is very based in materials and installation and sculpture. So um, to be totally honest, I'm really not sure what's going to come of all this for me yet. I'm still processing and um, I'm trying to figure that out, but I, I can say that it's given me so much to think about um, as far as our relationship to, to nature in general and how nature really is um, a very hard place too, right? And it has, and it has viruses that are out to get us. And so how do we find that harmony or balance between innovation and technology and the things that we can, um, we can gain from those like vaccines or, you know, or like the um, emergency protective equipment that is now littered all over the streets, but is also saving lives. And sort of like the other side of it, which is that we do need to protect our ecosystems and um, we do need to preserve these vast land, uh, like areas of land and, and ocean um, so that our grandchildren have a, a, good, a good life. And so it's, it's really just given me a lot of um, things to, to think about. And, um, and I'm sure that some work will come from it um, and time will tell what that looks like it might look very different than my previous work. Um, in a way, I'm fortunate because I do have still access to my studio where I work alone. And so I've been just quarantining in my, in my studio, but I have been able to make smaller scale uh, works that I've been wanting to make for a long time, but just didn't really have the time um, for before this all happened. So um, yeah, work in progress. <laughs> Hopefully it's an opportunity for us to create some two-dimensional works <laughs> <laughs> on Alpha because we never found a way to work together before because, you know, we've always been more focused on uh, 2D. Right. So it's it's an expansion for everyone and it's what we're seeing all over the, the art market. We're seeing, you know, just people adapting, trying to adapt. The museums are in, in, in crisis mode everywhere trying to figure out how they're going to, you know, connect virtually. They don't have tech departments, you know, mm -hmm. or anything of the sort. So it's, it's, it's a time for, for productivity, but it's a time for, for great challenges. And we have to, you know, understand that we're in a crisis. Uh, okay. So let's jump right into the questions. I think Renata has a question. I'm going to unmute you and you can ask your question. Oh, I think maybe you have to unmute yourself. <laughs> hey guys <laughs> so I just wanted to know uh, about those projects that you said you've been working on that had to be on hold now uh, or maybe like projects that you're not working yet but you'd like to create in the future um, once the crisis is over what is something that you'd like to create and share with the world yeah, I can jump in. Um, so um, it's going to sting a little bit to talk about this, but you know what? It's like my daughter says, uh, we're just going to put a pin in this for right now. And I, I think that's really what's happening here. But um, I, uh, this year is a really important year for the oceans. As many of you probably already know that this is the UN Decade of Oceans. Um, uh, SDG 14 is Life Below Water. And um, the mission and the goal is to protect 30% of the world's ocean by 2030. And so this year, um, uh, the overall collective body is meeting in October to vote on protecting what amounts to 2% of the world's uh, ocean in Antarctica. And it is under threat by two countries, namely Russia and China. Um, if one of those votes yes, then 2% or 7 million square kilometers of ocean will be protected. And so I had a series of art installations that were um, uh, scheduled to first debut on Virgin Hotels uh, around the country. Um, I do, I also do very large scale um, digital projections and um, so had a whole team, like a rock star team that was helping me. Some of the folks that were, that were working with me actually even worked on some of the racing extinction uh, projections uh, in New York City. 
And um, as you can imagine, there's a lot of planning. There's a lot of resources that go into such a massive um, uh, programming. Um, and then there was some stuff in New York that we were going to do, and and, uh, and we were starting to plan in uh, Paris. Because um, the goal is, if, you know, we, we were hoping that maybe we can get uh, France to kind of lean on Russia a little bit for this. And I think um, it's an important issue. And so when everything stopped, well, digital projections are a public uh, facing thing. So like, what's, what good is a digital projection going to do when everyone's staying at home? So I'm a little bummed because we put a lot of work into this kind of syndication of, of projections, but, um, I'm confident it will come back. Um, I just don't know when, uh, but in the meantime, as you'll probably notice on my social media, i um, I'm, I'm really pushing, uh, Antarctica 2020, uh, because I think that's that's a really important play. I mean, how cool would it be? Like the first year out of the decade of oceans that we protected two percent. That'd be so awesome. So anyway, but that was that was it was a little bit of a bummer. It stings a little bit, but like I said, there's a pen in it. Maybe it'll come back. But just to piggyback off off of that question, uh, any new technologies that you're thinking of implementing? Obviously, VR comes to mind because everybody's staying at home. Uh, yeah, I mean, so, I mean, not VR so much, um, but I, that's why I created Glitch, is I, I wanted to have an, an opportunity for, and we're actually building, um, so we're announcing it today, but we're, um, we're also going to release an Apple TV um, app, so you can actually watch this thing be destroyed in real time, and it's all based off of uh, autonomous drones that will be running in, uh, to start Florida waterways 24-7. So that's one way we can do something when everyone's at home. <laughs> um, but, you know, that's, that's all I got for now. But that, that, the, the crisis, you know, like, really pushed me to think outside the box on this one. Tasha. <laughs> um, yeah, I, so I actually was, right as this was, um, as this all started um, happening, the shutdown started happening, um, I had just completed a large scale sculpture for Corona USA, the beer. And um, oh, wow. in partnership <laughs> with Oceanic Global. So they've actually partnered to do a lot of beach cleanups uh, throughout the summer. Um, I actually sent you um, an image. I don't know if it's easy for you to pull it up the last slide. Um, but it. That's an image of the sculpture. And it's a, a large scale wave that I built out of all marine debris that I collected here in Brooklyn. Um, and so, yeah, it's actually, if you go one back, it's the one on the right there, uh, that one, yes. So this was a slide to show, I wanted to speak a little bit about how I like recycle materials within my own practice, trying to practice what I preach a little bit. And so this, these are two different uh, sculptures. The one on the left was, um, made a few years ago. And then the one on the right is just the newest work that I made um, that was presented in Las Vegas um, just in February, uh, beginning of March, and then everything got shut down. But the idea was that this um, sculpture would be rebuilt and um, presented at all 10 beach cleanup events to sort of inspire people to get excited about the trash. And then I wanted to do workshops, art making workshops with the participants at the beach cleanups and um, crowdsource those uh, materials from, from folks to potentially use in future um, projects also. So I'm really looking forward to uh, continuing these partnerships with um, organizations like Ocean Cleanup and um, which I, I did a sculpture with for Mohawk and then um, the, uh, Oceanic Global with Corona and uh, get more people involved in the beach cleanups and making art with the with the trash. <laughs> cool. Uh, there's one more question in the chat. Let me just stop sharing here so I can see the question. <laughs> uh, Jessica, do you want to ask it or do you want me to ask it for you? Uh, my question is more so it's just surrounding day to day. If there's anything that I can do to implement uh, changes to what I do currently, or if there are anything that I can implement that's new in terms of just daily habits that could help support the environment. I know we touched upon it a little bit, but I think about that a lot in how I can support the, the planet. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I think, you know, I already mentioned kind of the the um, the retirement accounts. It's something that we don't often talk about or think about. Um, but, you know, I mean, you you essentially sometimes people, they they have money in a 401k, their their companies match it. And a lot of times they're being invested into fossil fuels, plastic companies. And then, you know, you don't even realize that, you know, you might be against uh, these environmental practices, but you know, your, um, your, your, your retirement is being based upon that. And so, uh, why not divest and invest into technologies that you believe in? And, um, that can make a huge, if you do nothing else, that can make a huge impact because it puts the money in the right places and it funds the right issues. I mean, um, many Australians didn't even know that they were supporting the largest coal mine, which is the Adani coal mine, which is, is proposing to bring 520 ships into the Great Barrier Reef now. And so, there's just a lot of things like that. You know, the, the other thing I always, I always, uh, I always tell my kids is that, you know, well, do you really need that single use anything? You know, plastic has gotten the, the topic of this conversation for the most part, because that's the thing that's the ugliest thing that we see, but it's our culture that is at the root of the problem. It's all single use period, whether it's paper or plastic, uh, we really need to ask ourselves, do we really need to throw this thing away and why can't we come up with another way? And so sometimes that takes a little bit of self-reflecting internally to determine, but really what we do, it's not that we have a plastic problem. It's not that we have a paper problem. We have a culture problem. And um, all, all, as far as I've been alive, you know, I have been given this stuff and I've never thought that it was a problem until you know i got older and i realized hey this 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 culture is not one that i subscribe to so those would be the two things that i would shout out really quickly i don't know basha if you yeah concur. i would echo i mean both of those are are awesome things um for me on a like personal level i guess i could um i just i've, I've come to realize that often like the eco-friendly thing takes a lot longer and cost a lot more and i just try to still choose the eco-friendly alternative every chance i get um when it comes even to my own work like making something from a salvage piece of trash off the beach often just takes a lot longer because you have to clean it you have to sort it um or like patching something um mending something before buying something new um, those are just things that I really try to focus on is like prolonging the life, reducing the amount of new things I'm buying and really investing my time and my energy and my money into things that are really, you know, a little bit better <laughs> than the status quo. Yeah, if I could just add one last thing, which could be the most important thing you do. Reduce your meat consumption. <laughs> you don't you don't have to stop eating meat, but if you reduce, it makes a world of difference. Actually, uh, I, think I I went vegan like three years ago. Just this past year, I've been more like vegetarian because it's it's been really challenging traveling. Um, but I have to say that when I decided to do that, it was it just felt so good, you know. I mean, it just like, it, like it, all of a sudden, it, as environmentalist, I think especially, it's like there, that is definitely something like a personal choice three times a day that you make. That like really, it was wearing on me, and I didn't even understand or know how much it was wearing on me until after I like made that choice. And then I was like, oh my gosh, this is, this is, this feels so good, it, and it's really a like a positive thing. It's it's not. I don't see it as like something I'm giving up or have to go without. It's more like, wow, I'm gaining all of this, all of this for, for that small price to pay, you know? So yeah, yeah. I, I totally agree. <laughs> yeah. I mean, and, and, and to your point, uh, Manuela is like, there's actually a term for that now they call them reducitarians. So it's like, yeah. it's like if you don't want to go full vegetarian or vegan, you could be reducitarian, you know, you should do <laughs> your part for the planet. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. We have a, we have a few minutes left, Jeremy. Do you want me to play the other video since, you know, we have a little bit of time? Yeah, sure. Whatever, whatever you want to play. Um, I think the clip that you have is one of the drones that's in the waterways. Is that the one that you have? Uh, ultramarine. Oh, the ultramarine. Oh yeah. yeah. So this is, uh, so this clip is, um, it's a one minute clip of uh, what we did on uh, Necker Island. <laughs> yeah, here it is. There it is. <laughs> I don't hear any audio though. It's beautiful though. Yeah, there's no yeah, audio. Will you narrate for well, us? Well, I guess I'll be I, I hear the cool. audio, but maybe okay. let me mute it and you can, yeah. you can 
Okay. Narrated. That, there's okay, Richard so, Branson. There's Richard yeah, Branson. So, <laughs> so um, Richard uh, is so gracious to let us use his island for this concept, but I wanted to bring people together. And it, it's, you know, to Jessica, to your comment of like, you know, what can we do? I'm just some average dude, an artist. And I was like, you know, I want to bring the smartest people that I can find around the world that don't want to just talk about ideas. I want to bring them together. So I brought the Cousteaus. I brought, you know, put together Richard Branson. I've got my friend Susie Mai who co-hosted this with me. Um, and then we, we all said like, okay, what can we own? What, what thing can we all do? And so their scientists have already said what, what we actually need to do. Um, and, and what are the, what are the targets for SDG 14? And so, you know, could we actually create something that actually makes sense? Um, and so um, this year, uh, what I did is I, I brought the first lady of Palau she did this really cool thing. Um, she and it was really amazing because you know Palau is a matriarchal society, and so um, she says, "Yeah, my husband is the president, but in our society, when things don't go right, the women come to the forefront." So the Palau pledge was created by four women, and uh, Debbie, uh, the first lady, was the one who created it. And essentially, what it is is it's a stamp in your passport when you come to their country. They stamp your passport and they say. You know, I promise not to take anything that's not given to me. And it's just this beautiful poem that the children of Palau wrote. You sign it. If you do not sign it, you don't enter the country. It's a requirement. And so I thought that was so beautiful. I invited her to Necker. We brought, we brought the minister for the BVIs. And we said, hey, this is this really cool thing that she's done. They were so moved by it. They have now said, hey, we want to do this as well. And uh, we're going to be doing a virtual event in, on Necker in May. We're inviting 20 other uh, island uh, nations to be able to also commit to this. And the reason why it's important is because when they created the Plow Pledge, this was the stair step to them protecting 80% of their territorial waters. And we would like to ask each nation that participates to protect at least 30% of their EEZ being part of 30 by 30 agenda. Fantastic. And once again, using the arts. Using the arts. Everything yeah. in a beautiful little bowl. Yeah. <laughs> so guys, thank you so much. I don't know if anybody has any other questions before we wrap up. We have a minute or two, but if not, I've really enjoyed this conversation. I think it's really necessary. Thank you too for your practice. Your work is amazing. We'll leave some links as well and some references so you so you know the audience can learn more about Basha's work and Jeremy's work. Uh, and you know, we we're always open to continue the conversation. So feel free to reach out. Uh, we'll, I'll leave my email as well at the end. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you so everybody. much, guys. Happy Earth Day, everybody. Thank, Thank you. Happy Earth Day. It's really fun. Happy Earth Day. <laughs>